Hello and welcome to Nordnet. Today we are joined by Carlos de Sosa, CEO of Ultimavox. Ultimavox seeks to become a leader in the developing immune stimulatory vaccines to treat a broad range of cancers. My name is Roger Bernstein. Before we move on, it's important for you to know that this session shall not be considered as investment advice. Our only goal is to, to uh, learn more about Ultimavox, the company, and of course, its underlying industry. So Carlos, uh, you will now give us a presentation for Ultimavox. Thereafter, we'll wrap things up with a Q&A session. Thanks, Roger, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, it will be a pleasure to introduce to all your subscribers uh, Ultimovax. As um, you know, my name is Carlos de Souza. I'm the CEO now for uh, Ultimovax for one year, and I look forward for the opportunity to present to the company and also to answer the, the Q&A. So if I can move to our presentation, okay. So we are a publicly listed company in the Oslo Stock Exchange. So I need to show you this disclaimer, but let me start by introducing you the company, giving you an overview. So we are developing a next generation universal cancer vaccines, including our lead compound that is called the UV1. And these vaccines are applicable at all stages of cancer. We have quite an ambitious program. We have four phase two combination trials, including four out of the top checkpoint inhibitors. And these studies are running in more than 500 patients. Today, I will uh, prioritize in terms of giving news about a study that we are gonna present at ASCO. ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, is the biggest cancer uh, medical conference in the world. Normally gets puts together more than 40,000 health professionals. Of course, this year because of the pandemic is a virtual conference, but it's the most important conference and we are very honored to be able to present the results uh, of this study. This, uh, this trial is a phase one two trial in advanced malignant melanoma patients. Melanoma, as you all know, is skin cancer. And this study is in combination with the standard of care pembrolizumab. I will tell you a little bit more detail about these exciting results, but um, this, this study that we're gonna present you has the first cohort of the, the study, 20 patients. And in combination with pembrolizumab, we reached a 60% objective response rate, including a 30% complete response. And I will tell you a little bit more what does this mean. Importantly, the product is well uh, safe and well tolerated, helps shrink melanoma tumors, and helps patients with melanoma to live longer. We also have a platform where we are deriving different products, and we will be brief you touch based on that. As I mentioned, we are uh, listed in the Oslo Stock Exchange. Um, our market cap uh, from last Friday is approximately 2.5 billion uh, NOC. We have collaborations with multiple uh, oncology groups like the Oslo University Hospital Network, the Nordic Society of Gynecological Oncology, Halle University Hospital in, in Berlin, but also with two of the big farmers, Bristol Myers Squibb and AstraZeneca. So let's talk a little bit about the, um, the big changes in the treatment of cancer that have happened in the past seven years. The big revolution was the introdu introduction of these called checkpoint inhibitors that started mainly in 2011, 2014. And these were a big revolution in the treatment of cancer, replacing in a lot of treatments, the chemotherapy that as you know, is very toxic for patients. That is seen in the, the value of this market, the market in 2019, 25, $24 billion and expected to reach 20, by 2026, $67 billion. So it is the fastest growing pharmaceutical segment, not only in cancer. You see here uh, the, the, top, the top five uh, marketed checkpoint inhibitors. And you see highlighted in green and also in the little box, the studies that we have, where we have combination studies with four out of these top five. 
and through the pembrolizumab, the top one has about 60% of the, these total cycles. So it's really the leader in the segment. So what was the big revolution that the checkpoint inhibitors uh, brought to the treatment? You see there on the right side that the checkpoint inhibitors, basically what they did was to block the defenses from the cancer cells. Cancer cells are very smart cells. They are basically normal cells that mutated and they create a defense mechanisms against the immune system. And the immune system is the one that is responsible to kill the cancer cells. So you block the defenses, but the problem is, and in some cases, these checkpoint inhibitors have very low efficacy. You need uh, activated, educated, and expanded immune system. And that's what we do with UV1. So we activate, educate the patient immune system that then kills cancer cells in synergy with the checkpoint inhibitors that block these defenses and allow, allow the immune cells to enter into the tumor and destroy. We have a series of very strong benefits when compared with other uh, products in the, same, in the same area. The first one is, is the easy of use. You know, we um, inject intradermally eight times. So no complex infrastructure required. The other big benefit is that UV1, our product is ready to be administered when needed, is what we call off the shelf. So basically, you also don't need to do any pre-screening. The product can be used whenever it's necessary. It's also easy to manufacture as a long shelf life and a low unit cost. Very important when you start getting more and more combinations. So what UV1 does is basically educate the immune system to look for cells that express telomerase. And the cancer cells in 85 to 90% of the cases, regardless of the type of tumor, express this telomerase. And telomerase is essential for the cancer cells to survive. It's what gives them immortality, allows them to continue multiplying without dying. So they will be expressing telomerase and not subject to mutations. So very important from early stages to late stages. And basically what we do is we activate these type of T cells, this called the CD4 helper T cells, that are the conductors, the maestros of the body immune response. I will not spend much time here, but just to tell that we really have a, a quite an expanded and broad development uh, pipeline. The first three studies are already concluded a long time ago. We have now five-year uh, follow-up for survival, showing good, uh, good safety and encouraging results in terms of efficacy. The fourth study there says ASCO is the one where we'll give you a little bit more details. And then the four phase two studies with more than 500 patients where we have uh, studies in different combinations, in different types of the cancer and in different collaborations. But let me start by the study that we are presenting results at ASCO. The study was all done in the US. 30 patients that we already finished enrolling August last year. And the update we are giving at ASCO is a 21 month follow up of the first 20 patients in the study. The only difference with these two groups is the, the dose of the adjuvant GMCSF. So the first important results are the safety. Good safety profile. This is extremely important in treating cancer because a lot of uh, these uh, checkpoint inhibitors have you know, uh, side effects. Uh, some patients cannot even tolerate them. So it's important then when we uh, enter into combinations, we don't bring additional toxicity. And that is the case with UV1. Basically, the only difference for the side effects that the patients will be um, you know, having with pembrolizumab is uh, injection site reactions because of course we give these intratumoral injections. And all of these were very low grade, very well tolerated. Of course, the more exciting part is when we talk about efficacy results. As I mentioned, all patients were observed for a minimum of 18 months. And, we, and the responses are measured by imaging, MRIs, CT scans. So you really see if the therapy ever has an impact in 
reduction or disappearance of the tumor lesions, being the primary tumor or the metastasis. So what you see there is in out of the 20 patients, in six patients, we got what is called complete response. Basically, the tumors disappeared. So this is a 30% complete response. And an additional six patients, the tumors reduced in size. So this gives us what is called objective response rate of 60%. So means that patients, how many patients responded to the treatment by reducing the size of the lesions or by total disappearance, 60% of the patients. One patient had a stable disease, basically the, the lesions then change um, size and seven have progressed. And importantly, at 18 months, 80% of the patients were still alive. So the key question, you know, I'm sure you all have is, what does this mean? So in the next slide, we show you what are the results of pembrolizumab alone. And we use for that the Keynote 006, that was the study that uh, Merck Sharp and Dome, that is the, um, the company that has pembrolizumab used to get approval of um, pembrolizumab in a melanoma. We selected the, the group of patients in, from the study that are similar to the ones in our study. And you see there, the first, the first on the left, you see what is, what is the percentage of patients with pembrolizumab alone that had a response to the treatment. And you see there 33 to 37%. And when we add UV1, we got 60%. Very, very, you know, even, even more impressive is when we look at what was the percentage of patients that had the disappearance of the tumor. In the, when Pembro was used alone, they received five to 12% of the patients had a total disappearance. While when we add UV1 to pembrolizumab, then 30% of the patients had a complete response. So this is a very important difference when you look at, at uh, the results of this study and the reason why we have been having a lot of attention also from the medical um, and the clinicians uh, that work with us. In addition, you know, I show you also the, the difference in terms of how many patients are alive after 18 months, 80% of the patients in our group, 60, 62% in the pembrolizumab alone. And also you now then we talk about the next steps. So we are gonna have the, the poster uh, now in, in June 4th to the 8th. By the end of this year, we are gonna have the two year follow-up for this, the 20 patients, and then we are gonna have the first data on the second cohort. So we'll have in the fourth quarter um, data on 30 patients. Also based on these uh, results, you know, and the, 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 the previous ones, we have initiated a big study um, that is, is running in four countries, the US, the UK, Belgium, and Norway. And uh, it, this is a phase two, it's a combination trial. And where we combine with the other standard of care in uh, uh, treating uh, skin cancer, that is a combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab. So you see there one group, half of the patients have nivolumab and ipilimumab and the other half we add UV1. But in addition to this study, we have three more studies running. And this is part of our strategy of showing that we can use a UV1 in combination with different classes of drugs and also to be used in different types of cancer. The first one, NIPO, is uh, sponsored by the Oslo University Hospital. And this is a study where we have a collaboration with Bristol Myers Squibb. So Bristol Myers Squibb provides nivolumab and ipilimumab, and we provide UV1. And you see there, the study is running in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Spain, and Australia. We started enrolling patients in August of last year, and um, a very important study. Um, earlier this year, we announced two new uh, studies. The DUVAC study is a collaboration with the Nordic Society of Gynecological Oncology and with AstraZeneca a big study with 184 patients in more than 40 sites in 10 European countries in patients that have um, second line main, uh, in ovarian cancer. So we expect the study to uh, start enrolling patients by mid-year. And this is a very important study, not only because it's a new indication, but also because it's a combination with a new class of drugs, 
durvalumab and olaparib. And the fourth study is the focus study in patients with the head and neck cancer. Terrible cancer, less than 20% of the patients respond to treatment with pembrolizumab. So in the study, we are uh, comparing with pembrolizumab alone, and then we add UV1 on top of pembrolizumab, and the study is, is gonna be running in 10 uh, centers in all of Germany. How do we compare with other class of drugs? The important part to say is that we are not gonna compete with the checkpoint inhibitors. We're gonna be using combination with them. And then there are class uh, different uh, other therapies that are used to prime, to activate the immune system. And all of them are gonna be needed to treat these patients. We need as many alternatives as possible. Some of the big advantages that we have is the fact that we basically don't need to do any biopsies or, or take samples of the tumor to produce the product. And we also don't need to access the tumor to inject it like some other classes uh, of drugs. So easy to use, off the shelf, ready to be administered and low cost of producing. So very, very uh, competitive profile versus, versus other cancer vaccine approaches. We also have a, a new technology, the TET technology that is a, a totally innovative, where the adju adjuvant and the antigens are part of the same molecule. And we are very happy that we were able to initiate the first uh, clinical study in February of um, this year, uh, is running in the Oslo University Hospital in patients with prostate cancer. And we expect to also provide uh, some of the initial safety and immune activation data by the fourth quarter. And you see here the news expected um, this year. So mid-year, uh, the um, first patients in the DUVAC and FOCUS trial. Of course, also there, as you see in June, now the poster presentation of, at ASCO, and then the fourth quarter, the one and two year observation uh, of the safety and efficacy in this same study, and also the initial safety and immune activation in the 10th study that is with the new platform. And we are also working continuously in publications and presentations. Also for the, uh, your Norwegian um, members, you know, we have as a company a very strong shareholder base with very long term perspective, very important to really support the company in all of these developments. We, in summary, are a universal uh, company having the universal vaccine technology that is applicable in a different cancer types and in different therapeutic combinations. We have shown excellent safety and efficacy that we are now presenting at ASCO. We have a broad phase two development program with four trials with over 500 patients. A first in class and innovative cancer vaccine approach, the TED platform that we have initiated um, the first phase one study. We have validation of our approach through collaborations with key uh, oncology specialist groups and two large pharmas, an experienced team, a strong shareholder base, and a good cash position, giving us a runway to the first half of 2023. And with us, I want to thank you. Very good, Carlos. Uh, we'll move straight away to the Q&A session. Uh, for those of you uh, who have watched the presentation, we will uh, touch up on some of the, uh, the points you mentioned in the presentation, but we like to do that because it's not it's not everyone who who walked through um, uh, the, the presentation before they they see the or hear the Q and A session. So Carlos, I, I'd like you to to uh, to dig a little bit deeper in some of the points from the presentation. But for, but sure. first of all, yeah. But first of all, I will I will touch upon the uh, your slogan: activating the immune system to fight cancer. Can you elaborate? Uh, my question is. Is this what your competitors are trying to do uh, also? Or are there many different approaches uh, developing vaccines like yours? So there are uh, different approaches. I think that the, um, you know, it's important to, to realize that in order to treat cancer, very smart cells, you need different to, to hit the cancer from different sides. 
So in one side, you have the big groups that they where the big farm is working, the checkpoint inhibitors, that these are the, 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 the heavy, heavy weights in the, in the treatment. And then you have the, the, the cancer vaccines as part of this activating the immune system, because without the activated and educated immune system, uh, you basically, um, the checkpoint inhibitors cannot work totally by, by themselves. So our approach is quite unique. We basically um, educate immune cells to recognize can cells that express telomerase, and this is uh, almost like a marker of cancer cells. 85 to 90% of the cancer cells will express this marker, telomerase. Uh, other approaches uh, use, um, other vaccines use different approaches. They, for instance, they select the neoantigens. They, it's a personalized, what is called a personalized vaccine. You need to do a biopsy, select the neoantigens, and basically it's a patient by patient treatment. So very important for some patients, but not as practical for use in big number of patients, and particularly also subject to, uh, to mutations. And then you have another big group, the oncolytic virus, also very important, having shown good results. But of course, they also need to inject in the tumor. So both of these approaches, in a way, are a need to have access to the tumor in order or to do the biopsy or to inject. We don't need to have that, so we can use in a multitude of tumors, even if it's difficult to, to access, and uh, also at early stages of disease. So uh, from an analyst point of view, I, I'm working as an analyst all my life. Uh, I've, I've interested in the, the total market. Uh, can, can you, how big is your addressable market? That's one question. And what market share may you realistically uh, achieve if you're uh, you, you're hundred percent successful. So uh, and and furthermore, uh, I, I know you touched upon this uh, in in the presentation. Uh, the market itself, how is it growing? Uh, historical and and what do you expect going forward? Can you give us some some um, rough numbers on on these questions? Sure, I think you know that the the the. the the checkpoint inhibitors are not the biggest segment in treating all of cancer. Okay, so let's say that, but they are the highest, but they have the highest share of the market because they, they are expensive. So checkpoint inhibitors um, have, uh, you know, uh, recently about 26, $30 billion in sales, just, just this, this group and, and expected to grow uh, annually at 16% you know, reaching in, in about five years, close to $70 billion. So it's a very big, big, big market. Um, so that, that, that I can give you the answer. Now, our market share, yeah, that, that is a big question. But let's say that uh, there are tumors that are relatively treated by the checkpoint inhibitors. No, no more than 50% of the patients uh, respond in, in all the, these tumors. But there are some other cancers where they are not present, you know, they, they don't have efficacy, or then very low efficacy. I gave you the example of uh, head and neck, you know, where they only have only 20% of the patients respond. So if we can show that by adding to these, any of these checkpoint inhibitors, we, you know, increase in a, in a, in a significant way the efficacy. So, you know, I, I can imagine that our market share will be a, a healthy one. Yeah. So, uh, and um, of course, as, as, as you still are in the developing phase of uh, your vaccines, future revenue streams are not uh, given. So, in other words, the likelihood of success is the missing piece of the valuation puzzles for, for uh, yeah. investors. Can you, can you tell us about the results from your value studies so far? Are you satisfied? Uh, we, we are, you know, this is, of course, as you know, this is a, a challenge to all biotech. You know, we need to go through the development. It's, it's also true that the, the likelihood of success, it's higher in, in cancer because you need less number of patients to, in order to show the, the, the efficacy. And um, so the results that we have so far from the, from the first studies where we have, um, you know, in, in a study that we were combining with epilimumab, that is the, 
the Bristol Myers Squibb, the before these these newer checkpoint units were launched, you know, after five years, 50% of the patients were still alive, you know, and with epilimod alone was less than 20%. So just to give an example. So the older studies, but also the, the data from this new study uh, are really very encouraging and give us, you know, a more positive um, view on the, on the new studies that we are running. Of course, you know, we need to show the data but uh, it's already very, very encouraging. I, I like to shift so uh, focus on, on management and R&D. Uh, superior man management and effect an effective R&D division is of great importance for every company, but especially for those who operate within the pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical industry like yourself. Do, so my question is, do you have the right people on board today? And, and can you s say something about are you an attractive employer uh, uh, going forward? Well, I think we are a very attractive employer with such an exciting uh, uh, science and results. I think, I think we have a very, uh, very solid company. Um, we have uh, uh, both the, um, in our science team, you know, um, we still have Gustav, the founder and inventor of the, of the UV1, uh, you know, working with the company. He is, he is uh, well known worldwide, and and uh, on the on the TED platform, also the inventor and founder um, uh, that uh, that is still working with uh, with with the company, uh, Sarah Mangswo. You know, so very very well recognized scientists. We have a very good medical team. Um, Jens, uh, our chief medical officer, has experience from big pharma, and also, for instance, we have one of his advisors, uh, Steiner, that he is a well-recognized uh, professor uh, from the Oslo University Hospital, where he was responsible for uh, for all these clinical trials and an expert in melanoma, and um, and of course, other members of the team, a very experienced. All of our studies are run also by, as you know, by the big, big CROs or contract research organization. So with a lot of experience. Uh, of course, you know, I joined, I joined a, a year ago. I've been now in the industry for, for almost 30 years, you know, having worked in, in New York, uh, different European countries with Pfizer, Novartis, uh, Nicomed, uh, Takeda, several biotechs. Uh, so I bring uh, I bring also a lot of experience from the medical, commercial, and business development. We were able to attract uh, our new chief business officer. So I think you know the the, the team is definitely the, the the necessary experience. And also you know we are we are going to be recruiting new people as we progress. So we are uh, I think it's important to recognize yes we we have a lot of interest from people. Yeah, very good. Uh, let's talk about the, the financial situation. I I. I... I believe you mentioned in the presentation that you have sufficient cash uh, for the projects going to 2023. So, but could you could you uh, say something about the, the financial position? And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your largest shareholders. What can you tell about them? Well, you know, as I mentioned, we have about uh, 410 million knock in cash at the end of the, the Q1. So this gives us a, a very a very good runway uh, towards the first half of 2023, basically taking us to where we will be able to announce, expect to announce the top line results uh, from uh, some of these phase two trials. Um, you, you know, we, we, we had, uh, we had uh, Yelston, uh, Kanik, uh, Sund, uh, the Radio Force, the, the, the Norwegian Pension Fund, um, Inventu. So a very strong uh, group of uh, investors that have been with the company for some time and they have uh, all the time supporting in every capital raise they participate. So this is very good for a company to, to have uh, because they are very supportive. So, um, um, you know, we are very happy also with that, with that situation. Yeah, and definitely long-term investors. Absolutely. They have been so historically. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, we, I have a, uh, two, three more questions before we, we round this off. Uh, a little bit about the competitive landscape. Uh, what about the competitive landscape? Are there many large 
companies out there or many small ones uh, how closely uh, and, and how closely are you monitoring your competitors well we, we are always monitoring our competitors because it's important also to to to, to you know when we work in the development programs um the good thing is that you know the the and most of our competitors are similar to us, are biotech companies. Um, you know, um, probably the big majority of them, the ones that are really direct competitors, are at, at our stage of development or even earlier, most of them earlier. So we have a very good uh, competitive position. And again, we have quite a unique uh, mechanism of action uh, that, um, you know, gives us this uh, competitive edge. And as I said, you know, Cancer patients. I'm a, I'm a doctor. You know, we. You know, cancer patients are going to need different approaches. So we just think that our approach has quite a broad use uh, across multiple uh, cancer types and multiple combinations. So it gives us a very strong competitive. Uh, Short-term triggers. Uh, it's always interesting for investors to <laughs> to know what's coming, uh, especially short term. So you have a broad uh, development uh, pipeline. Uh, so I guess there'll be a lot of news uh, flowing in the near future. What, what news can investors expect? Well, this year, you, you know, we are going to have, we are, of course, as I mentioned, we are presenting the data from this phase one to a very important data now at the ASCO conference, uh, June 4th to the 8th. Um, and then in the fourth quarter, we are going to have the data from the full study, you know, 30 patients, uh, two-year follow-up from these uh, uh, same patients we are presenting now and the additional 10 patients. So very, very important data because 30 patients is already, you know, a good size for, for a, a, a study in this phase. Uh, but also uh, we are going to have the, the first data from the first product coming out of our second innovative uh, platform in cancer patients. So we are going to have the first data in terms of safety and immune activation. And that is supportive data to allow us to continue developing as that platform has the potential uh, for several products to come out of, uh, come out of it. So uh, also very important. And then, of course, you know, we continue publishing uh, uh, results and, and towards the, you know, the end of next year, we will start uh, getting some data from the, from the new phase two studies. I see. So, uh, final question. I, I, I open. Uh, I open for some concluding remarks, Carlos. So, are, are there anything you would like to add before we conclude uh, uh, this session? For example, what's wh what makes uh, uh, Ultimovax unique? Well, you know, I, I think what makes us unique is our approach. You know, um, the fact that we really trying to solve the, the problems of a, um, a wide number of uh, cancer patients in different types of uh, solid tumors. I think the results that we are going to present now at ASCO are, makes us also quite unique. And, and also, you know, as, as a company, uh, we are also becoming more and more present uh, outside of uh, Norway, outside of the uh, of the Nordics, because I think it's also important that as a company, we also promote the good science that exists in Norway and, and support also all the other biotechs that are working in this area. Because as I said, you know, patients will need every different type of approach. And I think it's time that the, the science and the, the medical um, you know, results that we are having are start to be uh, better known outside of uh, Norway. And in this way also attract a more diverse group of investors. And I think that is also quite unique. Okay, Carlos, thank you for your time and your insights. We will keep in touch hopefully later this year. Goodbye, everyone.